Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event, Writing for a Young Adult Audience. My name is Amanda St. Marie, and I sit on the board of directors for the new quarterly literary magazine. I am pleased to welcome you to our 10th annual Wild Writers Literary Festival, which is brought to you by Wordsworth Books, the Balsili School of International Affairs, and the new quarterly. Before we, be we begin, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our festival donors and sponsors, including the Ontario Arts Council, the Knapp Wealth Management Team of RBC Dominion Securities, and Audi Kitchener Waterloo. One thing to note before I introduce our guests is that the chat has been turned off for this event. If you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the event and we'll save questions um, for the group to answer at the end of their presentation or their panel discussion. Now I am pleased to introduce today's moderator, Sarah Martin. Sarah is a high school librarian in Kitchener where she has been connecting books and readers for nearly 20 years. When she's not sharing her love of reading, Sarah can often be found Zoom baking with her family or singing with the award-winning Da Capo Chamber Choir. Now to begin the event, I will turn things over to Sarah. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's panel. I am thrilled to have a chance to chat with these amazing authors. Um, I'm going to get them to turn on their screen <laughs> so we can see their lovely faces. Um, I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order, seeing as I am a librarian. And uh, I'm actually going to start with a little bit of the uh, introduction taken actually from their website because they are so delightful and sort of give a little glimpse, I think, into our author's personalities. So uh, starting with Aaron Bow. Aaron is a physicist turned poet turned author of novels that will make you cry on the bus, which I have done, by the way. <laughs> uh, in university, Aaron studied particle physics, has worked at the European Center for Nuclear Research in Switzerland and the Perimeter, Perimeter Institute here in Waterloo. Her latest book, The Middle Grade Adventure, Stand in the Sky, won the 2019 Governor General's Award for Young People's Literature. Her most recent young adult novel, which we'll talk a little bit more about today, uh, Swan Riders, is the second book in a sci-fi duology set in post-apocalyptic Saskatchewan and centers around the former crown princess slash hostage Greta, who is now transitioning into an AI while her world is in turmoil and chaos. I love the way the book is described on your website, Erin. It features robots on horses, orbital weapons, and big questions about what it means to have power and what it means to be human. Welcome, Erin. Hi, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Sarah, next to Sarah Raleigh. So Sarah Raleigh grew up in Southern Ontario writing stories about freakish little girls with powers because she secretly wanted to be one. <laughs> um, Sarah has her PhD in English, has contributed to CBC, Teen Vogue, Quill and Choir, and more. She's a huge fangirl of anything from manga to sci-fi fantasy TV to Japanese role-playing games. I'm very curious about all of this. <laughs> uh, the final book in her Effigy series, Legacy of Light, was nominated for the Aurora Award for Best Young Adult Novel. And her most recent book that we're going to chat about this morning uh, is The Bones of Ruin. Yes, lovely. I love that cover. It's so amazing. Um, it's a historical fantasy set in a version of Victorian London about an African tightrope walker named Iris who can't die uh, and gets tangled up in a deadly tournament of freaks held by a secret society whose members are all vying for power. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks. And last but not least, Heather Smith. Remember, I'm quoting here this beginning part. <laughs> Heather is a teller of tales and a bona fide twit. <laughs> I figured I needed to clarify that that wasn't me saying it. Uh, likes a good slice of toast. Um, originally from Newfoundland, Heather's East Coast roots inspire much of her writing. She has written picture books, middle grade novels, YA novels. Her novel in verse, Eben Flow, won the TD Canada Children's Literature Award. Her latest book that we'll chat about this morning, uh, Barry Squires, Full Tilt, is set in St. John's, Newfoundland in the mid 90s and tells the story of Finbar, or Barry, uh, Squires, who has decided he is destined to become an Irish step dancing phenom as part of the St. John's Full Tilt Dancers. 
while pursuing his dream full on with the encouragement of a quirky cast of characters, Barry navigates school bullies and family drama with Ferris Bueller-like irreverence and a temper he can't quite control. <laughs> Welcome, Heather. Thank you so much. And bonafide twit, never an insult to me. Okay, good. Whew. <laughs> It's like when I tell my students that I am happily a nerd and I would never ever take that as an insult. Um, welcome. I'm so excited to be here with all of you this morning. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to ask you some questions and give you a chance to tell you a bit more about the book. Um, audience, as we're going through, remember to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll try and answer them some of may maybe as we go along, but mostly at the end and we'll give you lots of warning. Um, I do love the fact that all of your books are so different from one another, because I think that's going to give us, the, our audience, a really good sense of the breadth of young adult literature. I, nothing frustrates me more than when people who don't know clump YA into a genre, and I'm like, oh, that is not, <laughs> there's, there are as many genres as possible in YA, so I do want to start with a general question, uh, which is kind of why YA? You have all written all different kinds of writing from picture books to op-eds to scientific writing. So what draws you to young adult, writing for young adults? Um, I'm just going to go who I'm seeing on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> and do you want to start us off? Sure. Um... You know, I didn't really, for my first book, um, it kind of tumbled out of me and I didn't think really about where it was going to end up on the shelf. But I had been reading a lot of uh, YA and middle grade and also a lot of fairy tales. Uh, and I think it kind of took that form because it was reflecting. But since then I've come to really enjoy um, reading and writing in YA for two reasons. First of all, I love to read YA because you're always guaranteed a story. Yeah. I read a lot of literary fiction too, and I love literary fiction. And, you know, I'm not going to put down our Nobel Prize winners. Um, but sometimes you pick something up and it's gorgeous and you read it and it doesn't amount to anything at the end. Um, and in YA, and this is my dog, Luna, who's supposed to be lying <laughs> under the desk. Um, in YA, um, there's always a story and it always makes a difference. It's never nihilistic. It's never a story where like your choices don't amount to anything. Mm. Uh, and since I really like storytelling, I really like YA. I mean, teenagers are our quality control, basically. Someone made them ma read Mill on the Floss and now they're done. <laughs> they demand from us a story. And then I like how they, I like the emotional honesty of YA. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a couple teenagers actually in the house um, and people say they're dramatic and they mean it as an insult, but it's really, teenagers I think really do feel like weddings and funerals every day. Like prom really feels like a matter of life and death. And YA is sort of a system of elevating stories so that they have that kind of emotional intensity. Um, and I like that about YA. Yep. Sarah, what about you? I'm a bit under the weather, so for those, just bear with me. Um, I think that when I grew up, those stories that I read as I was growing up really helped form me and shape who I am today. Um, yes, I've read, you know, adult, I've read all kinds of genres, I teach. English literature in different genres, um, different time periods, you know, early modern to, you know, um, contemporary works. But the worlds that I, that have had the most impact on me as a human being and that continue to impact, um, to have that impact on me as a person, as a storyteller, are those stories that I read as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, so my voice is, it just, it, it was never a question that my voice would end up being a young adult voice that I would write for this market um, and, and for sort of that youth market. And, and it's not just YA, there's also middle grade and, and that, but that's, 
you know, th- that was a important time in my life. And I think that, you know, what Aaron says about um, young adult books having stakes um, and having a story, I think that's really important. I think that's also what draws a lot of adults to read young, young adult books, right? Um, just how exciting these books can be, how they can be a translation of very big philosophical ideas without it sort of becoming mired in the philosophy and sort of all of the stuff about character and plot and fun and excitement and entertainment gets lost. Yeah. So I, I love that about YA and um, I love the idea that maybe one of my books could end up being like a story that helps form some other kid somewhere like me like, yeah. uh, grew up in Canada. So. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, I, I, I do really love that idea of, I mean, I read, I read all different types as well, but YA is definitely one that I will read mostly because I feel like I get all the feels, <laughs> but <laughs> without having to like, n- not have that plot that also pull us, pulls us through and yeah. Heather, how about you? You, in particular, I, you have a lot of, you write for a lot of different age categories. (laughs) I do. And why a, you know, the question, why, why a, well, why not? Why a, (laughs) Um, you know, I get a lot, I, I do get a lot of people saying sometimes, well, will you ever write for adults? And I think, well, maybe someday, but that's not, um, I don't aspire to that because that is not up there and YA isn't down here. They are yeah. different. Um, like Sarah and Aaron, I was always drawn to, I was, I was a reluctant reader. I didn't read a lot. So the books that stood out to me were the ones that were like the outsiders, you know, where there is a lot going on in these young people's lives. Um, I do read a lot. I read adult books and uh, young adult and I'm drawn to the adult books that have a youthful character in them. So Mm -hmm. there's just something about um, a youthful character, like uh, Lullabies for Little Criminals, which is an awesome book. So it's an adult market, but it's a youthful character in it. But YA has the edge for me because it's not a reflection on the youth. It is you are with that teen. You are with that kid at that moment. Um, and you're with them every step of the way. So I just, I love writing YA for that really, for that reason. It's honest, it's real. Um, adult novels, a character might have ups and downs and be an erratic character. And when you're reading it, you're thinking, oh, what, what is wrong with this adult? When you're reading <laughs> it in nature and they're going through it, it's like, yeah, this is so true. This is them. This is real. This is honest. Um, and you just want to be with them and, and see their journey. Yeah. Are there any pat- particular challenges that are unique to writing young adult literature or YA novels that make it different from the challenges that you face writing any other kind of novel? For me, not particularly. Like, um, I just write and I'm not thinking about what I'm writing. Um, I I don't want, you know, somebody sitting on my shoulder looking over policing (laughs) what I'm writing. Um, I think the only challenge for me in writing YA is making sure that anything that I have in the story that is difficult, that I do it um, tenderly and that I do it respectfully, because a lot of the times if you're writing about a difficult subject, like in my book, The Agony of Bon O'Keefe, Bon goes through something very traumatic. And when I was writing that, that was a challenge because I was thinking there are going to be kids who are reading this that are in Bun's position, have been where Bun is. And I don't want to like uh, trigger them or make them feel, I want them to feel supported. I want them to feel seen. Um, So I I think that mindfulness um, can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, I think it needs to be there. I think you need to be mindful when you're writing for a young audience. 
Um, I, I think that's really the only challenge I can think of. Um, the only other thing would be sometimes there are people out there who will not give your book to kids. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure not you, Sarah, you're an awesome <laughs> librarian, but there are people <laughs> out there who will, um, who will withhold books from, from people because they're looking at the content. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's a challenge for all writers for young people is making sure that your books are freely given to the kids who deserve them. Yep. Don't even get me started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not quite sure who said. Um, somebody said it's okay to lead young readers into dark places. Just don't leave them there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I like that. Yeah. I like that expression. Yeah. I think one challenge that I've always had, um, well, it's not something that's a challenge per se, but something that I've always been mindful of is pacing, just the kind of books that I've written and the feedback that I've gotten. I think I've come to realize that for young adult novels, uh, pacing and, and having things happen quickly um, is part of, you know, what makes a young adult novel maybe different, very different than an adult novel, for example. Um, I think with adults, you can take a little, you can take more time um, yeah. and maybe, uh, you know, you can sort of spend a lot of those early chapters just kind of laying things out. Um, whereas with young adults, I think obviously you need to have that context, but I think the expectation is that you want to, you don't want to spend too much time. You want to kind of get into the action um, a bit more quickly, right? Uh, so that people aren't bored. And yeah. um, and again, I don't I don't know if this is just expectation of the genre, or I, I don't I'm sorry not the genre the market, um, but even um, the readership. But <sighs> young adult as a market has such a wide variety of people reading it, that it just makes me think that perhaps it's just people how people approach young adult novels as mm. opposed to what the readers can handle or what they're into and, and this and that like I think it's just because you can't you it's hard to say you know this is what um a readership an entire diverse readership wants out of young adult books yeah specifically but just maybe it's the industry even but um I I tend to I tend to see that difference in sort of the pacing and the plotting between young adult novels and adult novels. Yeah. I really do think it's probably more industry related, related, like in terms of like the expectations of what editors and publishers sort of believe that young adult books should be like. Yeah, my challenges with them have always been kind of on the editorial side, like with Swan Rider specifically, the viewpoint character is, she turned 17 at the end of the story. Uh, but the people around her are anywhere from slightly older to 500. And uh, <laughs> my editor was like, you know, we really need more teen perspectives in this. And I was like, do we though? I really feel like we're just going to be interested in these people. And I feel like where they are in life uh, makes them 20-ish, not 17-ish. Um, and in the end, I just applied what I call the Six of Crows rule um, after the, the novel Six of Crows, where everyone is 16 or 17, except that's just their label and everything else about them makes you think they're about 22. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that Leah Bardugo ran into that same problem. Right. Yeah. yeah. I do think that when I see it from my students, I think it's a good point that they, and maybe it's because they've been forced to read specific books for so long and they mm -hmm. haven't been necessarily given the choice that when they're choosing to read something for enjoyment, they want to be hooked. And it doesn't mean that like, you know, something has to explode within the first chapter, but there has to be something that draws them in or they're going to be like, nope, I'm out. Because if I don't have to read this, I'm not going to. And so I don't, it's a very different way of hooking them in. But I do, I think that there is something to be said about it's, 
you don't necessarily have the same amount of time to like very slowly tell the beautiful scenery of the, yeah. Um, speaking of beautiful scenery, <laughs> I wanted to flip into talking a little bit about setting and world building. Um, and I actually, I'm going to start with Erin again, because there was a quote that I read when I was doing a little bit of research that I think it was an interview you did with Canadian Children's Book News when you said, people believe me about the spaceships because I got the goats right. <laughs> and the mundane earns the fantastic. So I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about how setting and world building and how would how does that happen in young adults and so maybe we'll start with the goats and the space spaceships and Aaron if you want to tell us a little bit more about your book too uh and then we'll go from there <laughs> um yeah so the book I'm talking about there are the um the scorpion rules swan riders duology this is scorpion the first one yeah and they're set on a they're set in post-apocalyptic Saskatchewan the first one as you can tell from the cover is a uh, is a female female romance set entirely on a goat farm <laughs> <laughs> these things are these things are you know these are these are these things are, are things um yeah so it's it's a permaculture farm which is also a hostage installation uh for the children of the leaders of the world uh, and if their countries go to war, then these children are the first people to die. And this is part of the system that the robot overlords of the world have for keeping peace. And it's worked for 500 years. Um, and it's a good deal for everyone except these seven particular children um, who are not having the best time and who are raising goats. And yeah, I do feel like part of the reason the fantastical elements of the story work. Um, and there are some fairly fantastical, you know, transhuman things where people upload their brains and, um, you know, the robots and the, um, the information technology that sort of surrounds these people. Um, to be honest, people are like, you're a scientist. This must be really accurate. I'm like, nope, this works with hand wavium and magnets. <laughs> but the goats, the goats are really, really, really accurate. I, uh, I nailed the goats. I nailed when they're planting garlic. It is the right season for them to be planting garlic. And they are planting it in a way in which garlic would grow. Um, those kinds of things are really accurate and really earthy and really mundane. And I feel like that kind of thing grounds a story, even if a story is entirely fantastical. Um, in fact, that's the best tip about world building I ever got, which I think was from Beth Revis, who said, tip, chip the paint. If it's, if it's your oh. far future spaceship, chip the paint on it a little bit. There are going to be corners where people's shoulders have brushed by for generations on your generational spaceship. So chip the paint. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So Heather, your books are not fantastic, or at least not the one we're talking about today. No. <laughs> not, not fantastical, but I feel like maybe those kinds of details are also some of what helps make the setting so believable. I know I felt like I was walking in St. John's. I've been there a few times with, because a friend of mine used to live there and I recognized places and yeah. What is it, what is it like to set up a realistic world? Um, <laughs> well, for me, as a Newfoundlander living away from Newfoundland, um, it's really great because I get to visit home. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, especially, you know, if I'm writing during the pandemic and I'm writing about Newfoundland, so I'm right back there again. Uh, world building as far as writing about uh, my hometown is not that hard. I just got to throw in some rain, drizzle, and fog, and we're good. And uh, make everything damp and cold. Um, yeah, Barry Squires, Full Tilt. I should, probably should show my book. Here it is, Barry Squires. Um, so it's set in 19, when is it set? I don't know, 91 or 93. And um, so, yeah, it was a lot of fun uh, going back to that time in St. John's and what 
um, shops were there. Like there was Lars fruit stand. It's not there anymore. Uh, and the key to writing um, about Newfoundland is to make people who aren't from Newfoundland really, really want to go there and to make the people who are from Newfoundland going, yeah, she did it. She did it right. Uh, and nitpick it and go, no, that wouldn't happen. Or no, that's not what that place looks like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just basically capturing everything, capturing the senses, capturing um, the smells and the sights and, and the sounds of St. John's. It's such a great place. I love being from St. John's and I love writing about it and I love sharing it with people. Not all of my books are set in Newfoundland, um, but the ones that do are kind of special to me because of, of the setting. So, yeah. I have to say one of the other details as I was reading your book, there was a moment when Barry was talking about the Canadian fitness test. And honestly, I got full on visceral. Oh, I remember that's 40 years ago. And I had this moment of, oh, I don't feel good. <laughs> and it's it was the this tiniest little detail. And I was immediately there. And I thought, oh, that is brilliant. That is that kind of little detail that can just make the difference. So thank you for bringing me back to those horrible moments. Sorry. By the way. <laughs> uh, Sarah, I, the world that you created in Bones of Ruin is just, there's something so, I don't know, I was gonna say dark about it. Like there's this grittiness that I just is so good. And I just know my students are gonna love this book. Um, <laughs> And so I'm curious, though, because it is a version of Victorian London. So how how do you build a world that is a world but is different than the world? And tell us a little bit more about your book. Well, yeah, Bones of Ruin, I like to call it uh, 19th century supernatural hunger games. Nice. So <laughs> it was kind of like this magical world, um, this magical tournament set in um, a real place at a real time. And it's really interesting that you say like my version of Victorian London is kind of dark. Um, and, you know, you can take versions in different ways um, because, you know, when I was growing up, I was taught a lot of European history mm -hmm. in uh, schools, but I was never sort of, I never knew growing up that there were Black people, for example, in London, in England um, at this time. And you kind of have to think about what kinds of histories are taught, yep. um, what's left out um, when we're taught certain things, even about our own country, right? I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of Canadians probably don't know that there was slavery in Canada, that Black people, Indigenous people were enslaved. Um, so, you know, when I told my version of um, Victorian England, I was mostly just telling a version that repopulates that time and place with people of color. Yeah. And that meant having to do a lot of my own research into, you know, okay, what would life be like? What are the things that, you know, a lot of people of color and particularly black people had to go through? Um, there's a really cool book called uh, Black Victorians, Black Victoriana. Um, that sort of talks about, you know, all kinds of black people sort of go, coming in and out of London, from missionaries to African ambassadors, to um, circus proprietors, to writers, singers, all kinds of people. Um, but I also did a lot of um, work when I was doing my undergrad and my graduate schooling on, um, you know, imperialism and colonialism, um, which is very rampant at this time. And, you know, and racism, a lot of racism that was happening at this time, um, the institution of, um, you know, exhibitions, these world exhibitions that you see, um, you know, like for example, the, the World Fair of France, um, which you see in Gilded Wolves, for example. Uh, I don't know if you guys have read that book, but um, you know, there's throughout history, there have been these world exhibitions that were meant to for a country like France or Britain to show off sort of 
their imperial power to the world by showing all these, um, you know, specific artifacts that they've that they've cur curated from quote unquote, yeah. curated from other places, uh, their colonies, and they're also human zoos. Like people, human beings were put on display in these exhibitions um, in zoos, and this is a part of history that was so prevalent and so normalized in the West, not just in Europe and in North America as well, up until the 1940s. And yet you don't learn about it. So I think I just wanted to, you know, to teach in a way to, to let people know that this yeah. is something that happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a version of young adults. Uh, it was a version of London, England but it's one that's based off of truth that yeah. took a lot of research. And also mm -hmm. it's hard sometimes to, to look at these dark truths of our own histories, but they're there. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then the fantasy, I, I actually find the fantastical parts like the more lighthearted, yeah. like the, mm -hmm. the death lighthearted part. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that. Yeah, like, a, like you said, a Hunger Games like magical tournament to the death. I love that that c can spark curiosity to say, oh, I want to learn about what, what am I missing? What have I not been taught in school? Like, I love the fact that that can trigger those kinds of questions because I do feel like so many of our teen readers are very curious. And so and hopefully many readers are very curious. And so reading something like this might spark a, okay, now I want to actually, I want to question some of the things that I'm hearing in class. And I love that. I mean, that's, that's the kind of poking that as a librarian, I'm like, Ooh, this is the best stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I want to start talking about characters and how none of us are teenagers <laughs> um, and some of us have close teenagers in our lives so maybe that makes it a little bit easier but um, I have to say for my book club at school we read a whole variety of books and we often do a tournament of books which is super fun um, but one of the biggest critiques my students have of novels is the characters that you can have the most interesting plot and the coolest world. And if they don't believe the character, it's what changes it from them liking a book and like, yeah, it was good to them loving and like being obsessed with a book and wanting to talk about it with other people. Mm -hmm. It's the characters that hold them, that mm -hmm. really draw them to the story that, you know, that's what they remember. And that's what they're the, also the most harsh about. So I'm, <laughs> I'm curious, um, what does it take to write a realistic teen character? And not in your, you're right, in young adult books, not all of the characters are teens, but let's talk a little bit more about writing characters and how do we make them authentic? I don't know, who wants to start this time? Heather, you haven't started yet. How about you start this time? Let's talk about Barry. Oh, oh, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, so usually when I start writing, um, sometimes I know the character before I've even started writing the book. And so from the beginning of the book to the end, I know the character and I know how they're going to react to things. Uh, and sometimes I'm writing a middle grade right now. And as the book evolved, the character evolved so that when I went back to the beginning to go through my second draft, I'm like, she wouldn't do that. Mm. This is wrong. She wouldn't know. I know her better now. Yeah. Um, and basically, yeah, you just, you have to know them outside of the book. So I know, that sounds really weird, but you can't <laughs> just know them in the book and in the circumstances that they're in, in the book. You have to know what they would do. You know, if you're watching a TV show, what would my character do in this situation? Oh, you know, yep. you kind of have to be really in their head. Um, and, and so that when the, your reader is reading it, that they feel like they know them, that they are friends with them. Um, and hopefully that they're rooting for them the whole time. 
but yeah, it's just, it's just getting in someone's head basically. And when I'm writing, I often, especially if my characters um, are in a difficult situation, I do this thing where if a scene is really hard, I, I'm kind of in the character's head and I'm really with them. It's like I take two steps in, but then I have to take like half a step back. I can't be with them completely at that moment because I'm not going to tell the full story. I kind of have to be a little bit outside so that I can capture the whole thing. So it's a mixture of two things. It's a mixture of what that character is feeling and it's a mixture of a little bit of what, what's around them or what's happening and how they're reacting to it. Um, it sounds a bit flaky, but, <laughs> but it's how I, it's how I, uh, how I kind of get into their head. I can't, I couldn't write the difficult scenes if I was with them completely, because it's like, I'm going through that too. Um, so I'm a little bit removed. Yeah, it's, it's, that's why writing is hard. I think uh, Ernest Hemingway, I think was the one who says, oh, there's nothing to writing. You just sit at a typewriter and bleed. <laughs> and that's <laughs> so true sometimes because um, when you're telling stories and you're telling stories of teens and their difficult stories, then you are feeling that too. And if you're not, your, your readers aren't going to feel that. Um, so you have to be feeling something. You have to be with your characters. And um, if you want them to be believable and true. So, yeah. Sarah, anything that you want to add to that too? Like when you're, when you're developing your characters? Yeah, you know, I read a Q and A in the chat as to um, whether or not we speak out, we seek out teen beta readers. And I thought, you know, that's something that I used to do when I was younger, when I was an actual teen and I was writing and I would, you know, seek out people my own age. It's, it's harder now. Um, to find teen beta readers, I think it, it would be a great idea too, if I had that kind of access. But, you know, I think another way of doing so is just, you know, hearing from teenagers who've read your previous works and what they think. And I think they're they're never shy to tell you what they think about <laughs> characters, what they think about any of your, yeah. any part of your book. And I agree that, you know, loving a character like loving the characters is often what allows people to really you know even if you have this amazing setting and this amazing world this amazing plot it's those characters um that helps um teen readers just really get absorbed into it so you know trying to figure out how these characters would act in relation to each other. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes creating like an alternate universe for them. Like if, if you know, all of these characters, Iris, you know, and in the Bones of Ruin, Iris and Jin and Max, you know, I imagine them like just being like teenagers, you know, yeah. like how would they act? Like who would be the jock and <laughs> or whatever? <laughs> um, who would be the nerd? So, so on and so forth. Or would there even be like those kinds of categories? Um, how would they hang out? How would they relate to each other? Um, and uh, I just think, you know, it's interesting that Aaron mentioned uh, Six of Crows before because I do think that sometimes the industry kind of puts an expectation that um, these teenage characters should act and sound like 20 something year olds. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, I do feel like is actually like more of an expectation and that teenagers would like that as opposed to, and, and there's very little room, I think for younger YA of like 15 year olds and 14 year olds, like that kind of gets lost. And I feel that way, even when I watch like a lot of television, it's like the difference between the Sabrina, the Teenage Witch show in the nineties versus the chilling adventures of Sabrina. It's like this idea of teenagers and, you know, what they're like and what, you know, what kind of voice that they have. I think sometimes it can be a little narrowed to be like, no, it has to be gritty and it has to be like adult and it has to be this and that. Mm -hmm. And I think just recognizing that teenagers aren't a monolith, 
that there are people who are very, you know, attracted to that dark and gritty thing. And there are people who, you know, are just kind of quiet in their own sort of space doing their own thing. And just knowing that you can't create, you know, the pinnacle, the teenage character that will appeal to all different kinds of teenage readers is, yeah. is important, you know. Erin, yeah. I wanted to ask you what it was like writing your non-human but feel very human characters in your AIs because mm -hmm. I think that was one of the things when I was reading Swan Riders is that I was like it was this interesting oh wait that that's an, this this character is an AI but they feel like that sort of how do you how do you do that when you create that character those characters those characters are my favorite yeah <laughs> yeah um there's a talking cat in my first book um playing Kate um and I often say the talking cat taggle and the um the uh robot overlords of the world who are actually you know transhuman intelligences artificial intelligences um have a lot in common really <laughs> <laughs> It's like if you gave if you gave the talking cat some orbital weapons, it could totally run the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like characters for non-human characters and also for villains, um, which are not always the same thing because I have a lot of very sympathetic non-human characters um, who are just five degrees off of plum. I think that is so interesting if they're just, they're almost there, but not quite. And there's this little gap. That little gap is so interesting and so jarring and it brings mm -hmm. people up short. And I really, really, really like that. So I'm always looking for that, um, you know, it's frustrating, I think, for other authors, for especially for people who are hoping to learn to hear me talk about characters, because characters are the one thing I don't really work very hard at. Characters are my gift. Everyone's got a gift, and for me, it's characters. Um, and so I don't work super hard at characters. I don't have a lot of techniques for developing characters. Uh, my only thing when I'm stuck is to read everything out loud, um, which, you know, particularly the dialogue. You know, if it's not working and you read it out loud, you're like, oh, oh. Right. oh that sounds like it's been run through Google Translate from English to Mandarin to Swahili and back into English. And it's English now, but oh, no, no one actually sounds that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm always I'm curious about characters who are just a little bit off. I don't often write what I call like the Sauron kind of characters, the the villain in Lord of the Rings, the giant eyeball on the hill. Mm. I like those people don't interest me because right. I cannot relate to them at all. So I don't even really find them scary. You know, they they might be a malign force that is threatening to the characters, but they're not going to haunt me. So I like the little differences. As is, you're right. It's the ones that you're like, oh, they're, they're going to be fine. I can try. No. <laughs> no, 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 I can't. Be fine. Yeah, yeah you're the, right. The Swan Riders in particular has one of the um, transhuman intelligences was made into a transhuman intelligence when she was nine. So now she's 500, oh, yeah. but also nine. Woo. And it's that was a terrible idea. <laughs> so creepy. You yes. Know? Yeah. So very much creepier than the rest of them because she's nine. Yeah. Yeah. Nine plus 500 is a bad nine combo. Nine plus 500 is a bad combination. Yeah. Yikes. Mm -hmm. We actually have a question in the Q&A that's kind of related to this. So maybe I'll ask it now. Um, where uh, Amanda's asking, how much do your own young adult experiences guide your writing for that age group? Oh, and then, yeah. Am I writing teen me? I'm writing for teen me. I'm always writing this book that like teen me or younger me would have needed and couldn't generally couldn't find. Um, so like the scorpion rules specifically is the smart, scientific, female, queer heroine who you never got in yep. 80s and 90s science fiction. Did you, Luna girl? Sit. <laughs> so I promised she wasn't going to bother us, but I was wrong. Um, 
Yeah, uh, it's, so I keep writing these books, you know, um, my most recent book is, it's the book with, you know, the animal on the cover and the, the shiny, shiny sticker. Thank you very much, Governor Generals. <laughs> Did you guys grow up reading like Old Yeller and Sounder and Where the Red Fern Grows, the books with the animal on the cover and the shiny, shiny sticker and the dog dies? <laughs> the eagle does not die. <laughs> so I write the books that Team Me wanted needed, couldn't find, but I don't really channel my particular experience onto the page. Exactly. Just my longings, my old things that I couldn't find. Heather, I think I remember reading in an interview with you that you made a comment very similar to that, that you're writing the books that you wanted to read at that age. Yeah, for sure. Um, because I wasn't a reader at all. And you know, not being a reader. And also I had a speech issue when I was young. So all of these things kind of made me and words, not friends. And, um, and it makes you feel like, just like you're not very intelligent. Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of my characters are a little bit like me because they're usually a little bit underdog. If you think about Barry Squires, he's not great at school um, <laughs> at all. And yet he, and yet he is like, and he yet, knows how to like work the system. Yeah. And I think that's, that's also something my characters have in common with me is that, you know, you don't have to be, um, you know, the, the best student to be smart. You know what I mean? Like you, mm -hmm. there's all different types of intelligence and all of my characters are very intelligent, whether their grades relate to that or not. <laughs> um, so I do write um, books that I would have wanted. Um, what Sarah was saying about the pacing and really having to capture you uh, pretty quickly um, in the first page of a book that is really important to me. It was important to me then. And that's why I didn't read a lot because most of the books that were given to me was like, I cannot read this. Yeah. This is boring. Can, can something happen in this book, please? And, you know, and a lot of the times too, I think, and, and it doesn't mean that I want simple writing either. I want really interesting writing and I want you to make the sentence structure really wacky. I want you to shuffle all those sentences around and make me think about what I'm reading. Uh, I think that's a mistake that some people think when they're writing for readers, young readers, and they want to um, want them to be into the story, that it needs to be um, quick and simple. And it doesn't. It can be so, so deep. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be, always be um, simple sentence structures. So, yeah, I just write things that I think are... Um, really meaningful and deep and interesting. And I hope written in a way that'll help people make connections that I'm not giving you the story on a plate that I'm making you think about things. Yeah, that's my answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Sarah? Yeah, definitely, you know, I take from my experiences growing up, um, sometimes very specific things and sometimes like that happened to me and sometimes, um, just very broad things. And I think, you know, a lot of those broader things, one thing that's really helped me as a writer is understanding that, you know, certain experiences that you have as a youth, um, you can still identify with as an adult. So just because I'm an, an adult now, does it mean that I can't sort of understand or identify with a young person who's going through, you know, feeling like an outcast, right? in a certain space. I mean, feeling marginalized in the space. Um, I think that young people might go through it a bit differently. Um, there might be different types of spaces that you might be marginalized or outcasted in, but it's something that we all go through, right? And we might still go through in society. So um, just kind of knowing that those experiences that I had as a young person are experiences that a lot of people have probably gone through. And then there's some, some specific things that I've gone through that I sort of take with me, but there's a lot that I can still identify with, helps me to sort of connect with my, my readers. 
Awesome. Um, we are getting close to the point where we're going to answer quite more questions from the Q&A. So this is first a little reminder before I ask maybe one last big question. Uh, if you have other questions, make sure you get them in there so that we can ask them at the end. But I wanted to give each of you a chance to um, tell us what's next. So we have, we've heard a little bit about um, each of your books, um, but what's coming up? What can you tell us? I'm sure there's stuff that you're not allowed to tell us yet. Um, but uh, Sarah, why don't, I'm going to go reverse order this time on my screen. So Sarah, I'm going to start with you. So what's next for you? Really quickly, uh, The Bones of Ruin is a trilogy. So the second book is coming out, I believe, spring of 2023. So look Yay. out for it. Yay. Heather, what is next for you? Um, I have a picture book coming out November 30th called Slow Poke, The Bell Island Mine Horse, and it's set in Newfoundland. It's my first picture book set in Newfoundland, actually. Oh. Uh, and it's about um, a pit pony. Um, I went down in the mine on a tour a few years ago. I didn't want to go down because it's, I just didn't want to go down there. But my daughter was holding my hand and I'm like, okay, I can't run away now because what am I modeling her? I'm going to be brave. So I went down in this mine and I was like pooping my pants the whole time. And then the tourist guide started telling stories of the young people goes back to the youth again to the mm -hmm. 11 and 12 year old boys who are working down there and the horses and I came up with a story so it was all worth it <laughs> amazing Aaron what's next for you I have three books under contract and I don't think I'm allowed to talk about any of them <laughs> um because none of them have been announced yet uh, okay. I have a middle grade um a kind of non-fiction um biography piece for younger readers and a book of poetry uh, and I'm juggling three sets of deadlines and I don't know. the middle grade is my funny one finally it's about PTSD but it's very funny it's <laughs> meant to be it's meant to be a comedy so I finally I always said I was going to write a comedy and I found the world's most traumatic premise for a comedy and I leaned hard into it lovely Mm -hmm. I like, I love books like, I love books like that when it's, a, it's you know, the topic is serious, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's very unsatisfying, but uh, it just means we're going to all have nature, to, you know, <laughs> the nature of publishing is, you know, you get to talk about stuff that you're super excited about and then someone gets excited about it and buys it. And then it's kind of theirs and you can't talk about it until they give you permission. And that's the thing. Sorry. Yeah. It's, we'll just have to keep our eyes open. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm going to ask a few questions from the Q&A. Uh, okay, so Lois is asking, how do you bring relationships with adults and parents into a story? Can you have some of the story be from parents' point of view in a young adult book or young adult story? Who you wants to can. tackle that first? <laughs> There's all, you, you, you can do anything. Um, that wouldn't be my first instinct because young readers generally don't want to hear what their parents are thinking because their parents are, you know, generally wrong. <laughs> As a parent, I am keenly aware that I am generally wrong. <laughs> um, it's a challenge in YA to have um, parents involved heavily in the story because most of these adventures um, that, and problems that my characters get into, you know, if they had a parent there who was a decent parent, the parent would step in front of the train, right? And shove the kid off the tracks. Um, and so I think there are a lot of absent parents in young adult fiction because young adult fiction is generally about finding your place in society, which is a little bit about stepping out away from your parents. I have a lot more parents in my middle grade fiction a lot more mm. adult figures because middle grade is more about finding your place inside your family. Um, so it's, I mean, those are sweeping and not all true, but um, yeah, I, middle grade is easier for me. I, my middle grades have a lot of parents and extended families and teachers and other people who are adults who are very important. And my YA is, um, is guilty as many YAs are of killing off a lot of family members. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
Heather's got parents. Yeah, well, it's something like in the agony of Von O'Keefe, she has absent yeah. parents and has found mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love a found family story so much. Mm -hmm. um, Barry Squires has a very lovely family. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't, and, and the family are in it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I would ever write from a parent's point of view in a story. Um, I don't think that would be my instinct either, like Aaron said. I, because I don't know that a young reader is going to really care what the parent, they want to be with the young reader, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and they want to stay with that reader through the whole story and see the parent through that reader, through the character's eyes, um, not through their own eyes, if that makes sense. <laughs> I would like to read a story like that though. I would like to see if it's if it's possible to pull it off. And uh, mm -hmm. I think the, the difficulty would be getting it through like an agent and an editor because <laughs> <laughs> like, the automatic thing would be like, nah, no. Nah. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's just like the industry sort of having these restrictions and ideas of what YA has to be. Right. But I would like to see us start challenging that a little bit and see what's possible. I like that idea. Let's challenge. Let's challenge the system a little. <laughs> um, there, someone who one of our attendees has asked, interestingly, that you brought up um, lullabies for little criminals. Um, the line between young adult fiction and adult fiction, and that very quickly disappeared. New adult category. <laughs> um, so what is the, what is the line between YA and adult fiction? And like, what's it, in their words, what's the delineator? I think it's just that reflective quality, you know, like lullabies for little criminals. Um, I, I don't know, there's, it's more like, you know, that it's an adult looking back, rather than you are with the young mm. person as the book is evolving. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would be the, the main difference to me. Yeah. Well, take a book like Room, where, where the narrator is five years old. Um, that narrator, you know, the whole point is what he doesn't see. Um, the whole mm. point of the story is the, is the limitations of the narrator. And I think often when um, adult fiction chooses a young, particularly a very young narrator, it's the point is that there's story happening that they can't see and then, you know, the whole effect is in the disconnection. It's a really good trick, but it's not YA's trick. Right. Um, okay, I was, I, there we go, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm just jumping on to thank you, Sarah Barton, um, for your thoughtful questions and for moderating such a stellar panel. I really enjoyed learning from Aaron, Sarah, and Heather about their individual process when it comes to developing young adult novels. And I'm sure folks who tuned in um, feel the same way. And I, I just really enjoyed how there's so many different perspectives um, when it comes to this genre. Um, in closing, I want to remind our viewers that you can find all of today's author's books from today's panel for purchase online from Wordsworth Books. Um, you can visit our online book table for a handy overview of, um, yes, thank you, thank you, Sarah, um, all of our festival <laughs> author's books, and I put the, the link in, in the chat for folks. Um, and then don't forget that the next Wild Writers Literary Festival event is today. Um, it's called From Stage to Page. It's this afternoon at 3 p.m. So if you have some time, definitely tune in for that. Um, thank you again for all um, for attending today's event. And thank you to our authors and to Sarah for this awesome panel discussion. It's my pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Wild Writers. Yay. Yay. <laughs>